Hello, wonderful AP Bio students, and welcome to our video on active transport. By looking at its name, you can probably see the word active, that it requires the use of energy. So I think of active transport in, in comparison to facilitated diffusion, that we, on our way to school, sometimes have to go uphill. So when we have to go uphill, we have to pedal the pedals, and sometimes it can be quite hard, and we expel energy, right? And sometimes our energy makes us sweat and we get tired, but our body is constantly producing more energy. So let's talk about the source of that energy. The source of that energy is none other than the superstar ATP. Of course, ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. And we look at this molecule, hopefully you see some things that look familiar. The first thing that you're going to see that you're looking at and it has two rings, nitrogen in it, probably you're thinking, oh, that's a purine, right? It is a purine. It's a purine called adenine, the same purine found in your DNA. So we have a purine and it is attached to this thing that looks like a pentagon. And you might think, wow, that looks a lot like a five carbon sugar. Well, if you're thinking that, good job, because it is a five carbon sugar named pentose. You know, pentose is a sugar, looking at its name. And then at the end here, we have these super awesome phosphate groups. And this is where our energy potential comes from in ATP. So we have not one, not two, but three phosphate groups that are attached to the adenine and the pentose. And in these phosphate groups are super high energy bonds. Bing, ding, ding, right there. These are our high energy bonds. And when these bonds are broken, it releases energy. So we can find ATP in a lot of different forms. This with the three phosphates is the most, is the form with the most energy poten potential. If we break off one of these phosphates, we get adenosine diphosphate. And sometimes you'll see it plus PI. That means because there's an inorganic phosphate associated with it. So adenosine diphosphate means that, okay, we're missing this last phosphate. This last phosphate, by the way, is called the terminal phosphate group because it's at the end. So we have ADP, which is just like a, it's ATP, but with less energy potential. And if it further gets broken down and we lose not one, but two, we're going to get a MP, which is going to be important when we move on into our next units. So AMP stands for adenosine monophosphate. So we have kind of three different versions of ATP, and they all... Uh, are going from high energy to low energy. So ATP has the most energy, then we have ADP when we remove one phosphate, AMP when we remove two phosphates. Let's take a little bit closer of a look at that. Here we have a simplified ATP molecule. This last bond has a ton of energy. I'm going to draw big things that show energy. And so when that is broken off, pop, it kind of gives us a lot of energy. Now, then we are stuck with ADP, right? So we went from ATP to ADP. That last, that second bond has a little bit of energy. So it's actually not as efficient of an energy producer when we break ADP down into AMP. And this bond has so little energy when it's broken that it's pretty much pointless. So if we look at the ATP cycle, we're going to start with ATP adenosine triphosphate. We're going to break that terminal phosphate off. We're going to get lots of energy, wah, and that allows us to do cool things like lift weights and win gold medals and stick out our tongue and look totally awesome. And uh, now that that last phosphate is broken off, we are stuck with ADP plus PI, or inorganic phosphate. So <clears throat> this is like, if I were to analyze this or make an analogy, it would be this is kind of like an uncharged battery, and this is like our charged battery. Breaking off that last phosphate is the most efficient use of the ATP molecule. So what happens is it's actually better for, to have that last phosphate added on instead of further breaking down the molecule. So what happens right here 
is a process uh, called for us is called cellular respiration where we get that inorganic phosphate bonded to ADP and we get back to our fully charged ATP molecule. Let's talk about ATP and how it can move things in and out of our cells. So ATP is uh, used when we want to move things a in the opposite direction of the concentration gradient. And it's usually always done by carrier proteins. So let's say that right here is in intracellular, intracellular space, and in here is extracellular space. And let's say inside of our cell we want a ton of gummy worms. So we have, we're just, we're just loving these gummy worms. These are my beautiful gummy worms. Now, if we look at this, we can say that the concentration gradient of gummy worms compared to inside of the cell from outside of the cell, would, they'd want to go from higher concentration to lower concentration. But we really, really love those gummy worms, so we want a way to keep them in and also get more in. So that's when we use our friend ATP. So ATP attaches to a site on a carrier protein, breaks that phosphate bond, releases some energy, and becomes ADP plus PI. And in that process, the carrier protein is able to move and actually push items against the concentration gradient. So it's going opposite direction. And that is exactly why we need energy, because going against the concentration gradient, it's like riding uphill. It's like swimming upstream. It's like, uh, I don't know, those <laughs> going against the grain. So uh, that is why we need energy. And this is really important because it allows cells to maintain a different intracellular concentration of certain things than outside of the cell, than the extracellular space. So let's look at something that should look really familiar to you. This is our sodium potassium pump. And you know that the sodium potassium pump pumps out three sodiums. One, two, three, and not one, two, two, one, two, three. And it pumps in two potassiums. I'm not sure why that only shows one, but it pumps in two potassiums. So for every turn of the pump, we get a we get three positives pumped out, and we get two positives pumped in. So what happens is we have, for every single turn of that carrier protein, which of course requires energy from ATP, we transfer one positive charge from the cytoplasm inside of the cell to the extracellular fluid. It's a lot like charging a battery. So what happens is if I were to use plus signs to show relative charges or the sizes of plus signs, that net gain of one positive per turn of the pump makes the outside of the cell, the extracellular fluid, very positive. And the inside of the cell, less positive. So it's not that the inside of the cell is actually negative charged, it's just more negatively charged than the outside of the cell or less positive. This is important because the sodium potassium pump maintains this charge difference in which the cell can tap on to, to do really super awesome things, which we're going to study about a little later. Another thing that the sodium potassium bring, pump brings up is the concept of an electrochemical gradient. Gradient. <laughs> So when we studied osmosis and diffusion, we looked at uh, concentration gradient. Well, this is the same thing. We're still going from high to low. Um, but instead of concentration, let's break this down. We have electrical factors affecting the gradient, and we also have chemical factors uh, um, basically affecting the gradient. So our gradient, uh, with, with the outside, it has more sodium, right? Because sodium is being pumped out three at a time. So we have a lot of sodium out here. Sodium, 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 sodium. This is our chemical gradient. And we don't have that much sodium in here. Maybe we have 
too little sodium. So we have a higher concentration of sodium on the outside, a lower concentration of sodium on the inside. So that chemical gradient, the sodium is going to want to go in. We also have an electrical gradient because we have a greater positive charge on the outside than we do on the inside. So the gradient of the basically the electrical charge, the voltage, is going to want to basically equal itself out and the in Tercell, intracellular space is going to want to become more positive and the extracellular fluid is going to want to become less positive. So we also have this force, this electrical. So this is like a double whammy gradient. We've got an electrical gradient and we also have a chemical gradient. And this is what the sodium potassium pump maintains because the cell can tap that it can tap that gradient and it can make uh, it can and it can cause a lot of really cool things to happen so there's another type of active transport that I'd like to talk about and that is the concept of co-transport and it's basically the uh, ATP is being used indirectly to get large molecules like our friend sucrose here into the cell which is normally pretty hard to get into the cell so what happens is we have this um, hydrogen proton, so uh, a plus one proton. And we use ATP to move hydrogen pretty quickly through a proton pump. So the proton pump is constantly just pushing hydrogen out, okay? So this creates, whoa, went a little crazy there. This creates a more positive extracellular uh, fluid, right, because we're moving a lot of these positively charged protons out and a more negative intracellular fluid. So now we've created this concentration gradient, right? The hydrogen ions are a greater concentration here and less concentration here. So naturally, they're going to want to flow back into the cell to get to equilibrium. Well, luckily, we have this awesome thing called a co-transporter. And the co-transporter uses this concentration gradient created by the proton pump to move hydrogen back into the cell. However, it will not be moved back into the cell unless sucrose is with it. So they have these little kind of like uh, affinity sites or activation sites that attract these two items and once they're engaged the protein will move them into the cell membrane. So this one right here, this co-transporter does not use ATP but the proton, proton pump does use ATP. So we are getting sucrose into the uh, cytoplasm of the cell by using ATP indirectly. And this is a really efficient way to move large molecules. I have a little analogy for that. I have two actually. It's kind of like pumping water up into a water tank. And so it takes energy, right, to pump the water up into the water tank. However, once it's up there, we can use gravity to create the pressure that we need in our faucets. Another analogy, which is a bit more of a stretch, is this. We have this inside of the cell is a super fun dance party. And the super fun dance party, party is where you meet your soulmate and you dance all night and it's just amazing and like you just never ever want to leave. Well, occasionally we get this frumpy man at the dance party. And he doesn't have a partner. And he's frumpy. Who would want to be his partner, right? <laughs> That's mean. Uh, it's what's on the inside that counts. So what we do is we spend a little energy on this frumpy man. We give him a shower. He's lifting some weights, getting some exercise. And now frumpy man turns into awesome man, right? So awesome man's outside of the cell. He's like, sweet, I'm awesome now. I think I'm going to try to get back into that super fun, awesome party. Well, in order to get into that super fun, awesome party, you need a dance partner. And your dance partner is a, another super awesome woman or sucrose. So Frumpy man turns to awesome man, meets awesome woman. They go, they both go to the uh, gates of the club or the bouncer of the club and they say, oh, you're both here, you're a couple, come on through. That's my analogy, not sure if it works for you, but that's kind of how I think of it. 
Another type of active transport that uses ATP is of course our uh, phagocytosis, which moves large molecules into and out of the cell by folding the membrane. And also pinocytosis, which is this one right here, which is the same thing except for moving cytosis, except for moving much smaller molecules. There's one more type of uh, membrane transport that I'd like to talk about, and that is receptor-mediated endocytosis. And it seems like a long, crazy word, but it's pretty easy to, to understand. So basically on the cell, there's these little uh, receptor proteins. And these receptor proteins are specifically shaped for a special substance, and we know these special substances are called ligands, to attach to it. And the thing about these receptor proteins is it allows the cell to get a higher concentration of that specific substance than is available in the extracellular fluid. So once a large section of these protein receptors have a ligand attached to it, it will trigger endocytosis and the cell membrane will fold in and create a vesicle. And you can see in the vesicle that we have a higher concentration of these ligands per other solutes than we do outside of the cell. So it allows the cell to kind of wait out there, kind of like a coral, right? And wait for exactly what it wants and grab onto it and then move it all in at once. Um, a disease that's correlated to this whole process is um, a really long name. It's called familial hypercholesterol. Cholesterolemia, familial hypercholesterolemia. This is basically fancy for you have high cholesterol and it's genetic. It's passed down from your parents. And the reason that it's passed down from your parents is because something in your DNA is messed up. You have messed up code in your DNA that codes for the shape of these awesome little receptor proteins. And if your shape is messed up, let's say, you know, the ligand you need is triangle, but the shape of your receptor protein ends up being more U-shaped. So your receptor protein is not able, or sorry, your ligand is not able to bond to that receptor protein. So what happens is you have this like weird shaped receptor protein for what is called LDL. And LDL is just fancy for uh, low density lipoproteins. And these are basically cholesterol. So you have cholesterol floating around in your blood and you have these receptors outside your cell that wait to grab onto them and bring them into the cell so it can be used for to make um, steroids or to make more membrane. So what happens if you have messed up receptors and your cell can't bring in that LDL or that cholesterol, then you get a buildup of cholesterol in the bloodstream. And we know that when you have a buildup of cholesterol in the bloodstream, you have the narrowing of, vessel, uh, narrowing of blood vessels and also blood flow is impeded and you get a lot of issues from that. So in review, we talked about ATP and how exactly its chemical structure makes it high energy. We talked about how ATP um, moves things, uh, uh, moves items against the concentration gradient uh, through carrier proteins. We also had an example of that, which is the sodium potassium pump, which creates and maintains membrane potential. And that membrane potential is the uh, result of this electrical chemical, electrochemical gradient that we have acting on the cell at all times. We also talked about co-transport, how two proteins can work together. One uses ATP to uh, move hydrogen ions across the membrane quickly. And the other one is a co-transport protein which brings hydrogen ions and large molecules like sucrose at the same time. I forgot to mention that this co-transport is really important in plants, 
especially when we're moving sugars from the photosynthetic areas like the leaves to the non-photosynthetic areas like the roots. So this is how sugar is moved in the plants to make new structures. We did a quick review of phagocytosis and pinocytosis and how the folding of the membrane um, is as a result of using ATP to bring in or get out uh, small or large molecules. And we also talked about receptor-mediated endocytosis and how if you have uh, genetic high cholesterol, that the cause of that is because of those little receptor proteins on your cell are misshapen and can't bond to the LDL. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed and I uh, will talk to you soon. Take care.